We are comicbookinvest.com on with three comic money coming to you with our latest interview. So, uh, guys, once again, this is three comic money. Uh, we're, we're, you can tell we're changing it up every week now as we're just bringing in some awesome guests. Perfect week. Star Wars is going crazy in the comic book world, and we reached out and we got John Jackson Miller, who wrote like if you've read Dark Horse, he wrote like all of them. No, uh, not I'm exaggerating, but he wrote <laughs> Knights of the Old Republic, and we're going to pick his brain on that. And he wrote uh, two or three other ones that are a little bit shorter, but man, he's written some awesome stuff. And then you, you can see his books behind you; they're hanging up on the wall there uh, with Star Wars books and Star Trek and lots of different things. Iron Man, I think, as well. Um, so we're excited to have him on. Um, we brought in Ben C, who does, who is the Star Wars list guru. So we have Mike, who contributed to it, Peter, who thinks he knows stuff, me, who just waits until they tell me what to pick up, and uh, and Ben, who writes all these amazing lists, and it's exciting. And then John, John's going to help us out and just sort of say, "You're wrong. You're dumb. You're stupid. This is this is what it actually oh, no. is. This is what I intended." Um, which is great. And the, the great thing is this is Tuesday and we don't give it to you until Saturday. So we will have all the books now. <laughs> but uh, this uh, is the truth. And this we're is almost just going to nerd out for the next hour. Yeah, yeah basically. And I'm going to go, I already have that. I don't need to hunt for it. I don't like Chris. Have a copy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got my entire KOTOR run. So whatever. Yeah. Now, some of mine are beaters. Christy, I got them. I mean, they're my teenager copies. So some of them have been, you know, well read. But <laughs> I just finished reading KOTOR. Three days ago. Nice. And it took me way longer than it should have because it was one of those. What's well, 1,284 pages? <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> but who's it's counting? In perspective, I'm like, I guess I should have been quicker. Shit. <laughs> oh, um, I, I, I'm sure we're just going to let you dive in, but I just, I, I loved it. I haven't loved a comic in a long time. Oh, Coder, man. man. Thank you. Oh, no, man. No. I have so many questions. I don't let people. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and so the guys, uh, what we're doing, we're just going to talk Star Wars. Uh, John Jackson, you okay? Is it John? Is it Jackson? Is it Miller? Or like it's, it's John. I I worked for a company called Miller Publishing, and if I wanted to get my mail, I had to have the middle name. Gotcha. So. <laughs> okay. Just because it's going to be hard for me to go John Jackson every time. John no, no, Jackson. John, John's cool. <laughs> so uh, the cool thing is, he picked Star Wars as the theme. He, I mean, he gave us two different topics. Of course, we went with Star Wars. Uh, we're, we hopefully not have him back on because uh, if you also don't know, I'm gonna throw this out. He's also the Comic Con guy. He's he created the website. We will pick his brain on that a little bit too, hopefully. Um, and hopefully, we'll get to shoot the ball. His other topic was fabulous as well. But we mm -hmm. wanted to talk Star Wars with him. Um, and he picked three amazing books. And we're just gonna talk about the books, and then we're gonna pick his brain. Well, during the process, we'll just pick his brain on everything Star Wars related. Um, the first book you picked is the one that started it all. With Marvel, uh, the Marvel, the 19, is it 70? Tell it's me, 1977. 77. Uh, Heroes and, yeah. Born. And just tell us why, tell us again why you picked it. Uh, you wrote a great well, paragraph we're actually using on the site. But. Well, what I want to do uh, is I, by picking these three books, they're each kind of at a different stage of my career as a collector uh, and, and also my career as a, a person with a career. Uh, but then also, <laughs> uh, they each typify a specific period in publishing uh, and in collecting. Uh, and I, I try to weave all this together because, again, as you say, I I am a, a, a originally a fan. I still have comics. I have a, whole, a building full of them over here. Uh, <laughs> I, I actually had to buy a second. Uh, I, 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 I have this very, very weird world where I when I was looking for a place, I was looking for a place that had an extra building for the comics. Uh, and I had to have an engineer come out and look at the uh, ceilings to make sure that they didn't crash in on my car. Because uh, it's, it's uh, you know, the, the, the room is rated to 17,000 pounds, so hopefully they'll hold it up. <laughs> he, said, he said, we hate books. We hate it's, it's, it, it, it. I've got about, I have just about every comic I ever had ever since I started collecting at age six. Uh, so it's about 45,000, something like that. It's not, it's nothing compared to a lot of other collections, but it's, uh, it's mine. Um, hey, and, that's more important. And, uh, and, uh, but, but anyway, again, this starts back there in the seventies and, uh, in the seventies, of course, is a terrible time for the comics industry. It's nearly collapsing. Uh, DC has its implosion. Uh, Marvel is at the time owned by a chemical company uh, it, that has absolutely no desire to 
yeah, the, the company is basically for sale the entire decade. Uh, they're looking for a place to dump it all the time. And then Roy Thomas basically uh, has dinner with George Lucas one night. And uh, George uh, wants to actually share with him. Uh, it, was, it, was, it, was a, it, it was a hangout based on a love of comics. Uh, George uh, was interested in showing, either George was showing Roy or Roy was showing George a Carl Barks Uncle Scrooge painting. Uh, oh. and, and this led to George saying, hey, I've got this movie. Uh, Marvel was at the time licensing just about everything because the way that they were dealing with DC uh, you know, being in such trouble is they were printing ridiculous numbers of copies, uh, comics. There's a stretch in there in the 70s where Marvel has 20 different titles just devoted to reprints. Uh, and, and, you know, they don't... The reprints back then weren't the way that reprints are now where you'll slap a new cover on them. We'll get to that. But yeah. they would they would have a, a title where it would be sort of like reprint theater. It's Marvel Tales yeah. Uh, yeah. or Marvel Triple Action or something like that. Collector's like items. items. Which is just a way of, you <laughs> yeah. know, sneaking up on the kid and, you know, throwing something at him that they, they, they've already read. But again, we didn't have trade paperback, so that was the way you did it if, if you didn't want to hunt back issues. Uh, anyway, so uh, Roy gets Marvel uh, to bite the bullet and do six issues of Star Wars. It was very important to George that they get something out there in the world for Star Wars making money uh, and also uh, sort of advertising it before it came out. Yeah, the, uh, because, toys, the toys weren't going to make it in time. So, Well, they were going to make it in time. And again, what's special here, well, George has he's negotiated a deal. I call him George like I've met him. I really haven't. <laughs> uh, but, he's, it, but he's made a deal where um, he gets the merchandising. He, they, they thought he was crazy. Merchandising, I mean, you know, the only movie that had done any merchandising action at all had been, uh, anybody guess this one? Planet of the Apes. Godfather. There you go. He's got it. Planet of the Apes, and and it wasn't much of that, um, but you know they they you know Star Trek the TV show had you know, this and that here and there, but you know we had with with uh, with Lucas he was going to do the whole nine yards, so he gets two things out immediately. Uh, the first thing is uh, a novel. It's it's the uh, it's the it's the paper or it's not paper. It's the hardcover. Uh, of the of the New Hope, the adaptation that George puts his name on, but it's written by Alan Dean Foster, uh, and it comes out in December '76. So we're looking at six months before the movie, five months before the movie. And you know, if you were just somebody wandering around the bookstore, you'd be like, "What is this? A regular? It's a it's an actual science fiction novel here." And then with Marvel, uh, they uh, they had the comic book come out. Um, I could not find my Star Wars one. Uh, for this, uh, sometime I, I I've used as a prop sometime, and I have not got any idea which where where any of my Star Wars ones are at the moment. Somewhere between here and the other building, I hope. Uh, but the 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 the, the thing we want to keep in mind with this book is there are multiple versions of number one because of the way that the industry worked at the time, um, and the one that I. Uh, have comes later in, or the, the, the one I got first as a nine-year-old comes later in this process. Uh, but this this is sort of a, an indicator how these things uh, were done back then. I did a column uh, in Comics Buyer's Guide about 15 years ago where I, I, uh, I, I coined the term paleo variants. Uh, these are variants which were not really supposed to be variants. Uh, these were variants that nobody, variants from back in the day before anybody cared. Um, and one of the distinctions is, is it a newsstand cover or not? Well, at the time and for 30 years, the Overstreet Price Guide and everybody in the business said, there's no difference. We shouldn't care. Uh, and it isn't really until you get the rise of uh, uh, well, really, it was it was it was Chuck Rosansky with Mile High Comics. I was gonna say it was Chuck, but I didn't yeah. want to be that yeah. aggressive. Yeah, guy. yeah. No, yeah. No, it was, no, it was Chuck. No, it was Chuck. Oh, it's a beautiful write up he does on the site. Like he, the he did it, and 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 he was the one that first started saying this should be separated out. These are smaller in number. Now, now the truth is they're not really as small as people think, 
yeah. at the times that they think they are. But that's one of the reasons Comicron exists. I've got that data. It's just not online. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> yeah. keep it in your back pocket. Like I'm gonna trump you when we're ready. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but but again, you know, Star Wars One comes out. Uh, you know, with with a thirty cent cover. Uh, with uh, Curtis new Curtis circulation box. That's a box instead of this diamond here. Uh, mm -hmm. That goes to uh, that goes to the newsstands. Uh, March of '77, so two months before the movie comes out, uh, and and uh, they also simultaneously put out the only Star Wars comic that I think should actually be particularly valuable. Uh, That's it, uh, and that is the 35 cent variant because that only was test marketed. Uh, in uh, my research, said it was only in uh, um, Memphis, San Antonio. You know, I've got, um, I've got, I've got, I've got St. Louis. I've got Grand Rapids. Uh, there's uh, again, it's just, it's, it's, it's really hard to know for sure where they really turned up. Yeah. We just know that there's maybe like fifteen hundred of them. Yeah. Uh, Forty so years ago, pre-internet, so yeah, not yeah. easy information uh, to obtain. So, so you had those two, but then you had a third simultaneous printing which again for years everybody got wrong because they thought it was a reprint uh and that has to do with with um another thing that was going on in the 70s uh, and this is whitman and the bag reprints and the bag not reprints um what was happening in the 1970s that caused dc to implode is basically every store that was carrying comics at the time uh, that wasn't a comic shop. So basically, the the the, the returnable marketplace, your Seven Eleven, your grocery store, your Walgreens, those places start dropping comics. Mm -hmm. They drop comics because they're not selling enough. They have to print three, four to sell one, uh, and and you know they just they don't want to put a spinner rack in here. Uh, and the spinner rack to begin with was the spinner rack actually to begin with was a place for newsstand outlets to dump comics. So they wouldn't be in the way. Uh, they were basically supposed to be a place to ghettoize comics and get, get, get rid of them. The Comics Magazine Association of America invented it to prevent grocery stores and places like that and 7-Elevens from getting rid of comics entirely, which is what they wanted to do. Uh, and so a whole lot of places got rid of them. And what Western Publishing down in, uh, down in uh, Racine did uh, is that they were the people who did Gold Key Comics. What they did is they had these bags that they were going to market in comic shops as, or not comic shops, but in in, in uh, department stores, and they're going to sell them in the toy section. These had been around since the 60s. Uh, look up DC Comic Packs. Uh, back in those days, they actually, on the DC Comic Packs, they would actually print on the label what issues were inside, so you didn't have to do this number here, <laughs> which everybody of a certain age remembers doing. Oh, yeah. I still, still do it. Uh, well, uh, five below two weeks five ago. Below, yeah. <laughs> so, so what happens is in the in the uh, in the early seventies, uh, Western starts doing that with their own comics from Gold Key. In uh, seventy six, they go to Marvel and they say, "Hey, we'll buy part of your print run if you will put on if if, if we can put them in these bags." Uh, and they simply had to make sure that they changed the cover. Because what happens if you don't have a different logo on the cover of this Star Wars number two, which came from one of those bags? If you don't have a different logo on the cover, well, those comics were returnable in those days. So uh, what would happen that's why they is... they did the diamond. Yes. So what would happen is, um, you know, the, the retailers, when they didn't sell the comic book, they would cut the top off of it and they would send those in and magazines and everything was like that. And it's why inside the magazine it says, do not sell this cover if it is stripped. And what strip means is it doesn't have the logo. Yes. Uh, and it's also why, if you're of a certain age, you have seen ridiculous numbers of strip comics everywhere. Hey, we, we comics. did do flea markets all the time. The remainder yeah. copies the are all over remainder the Remainder copies, yeah. I, uh, I, wrote a, I wrote an issue of uh, Bart Simpson a few years ago where a uh, comic book guy has a box of coverless comics and he describes this process and he weeps and he wants to give them a Jedi burial. Uh, he says, I, wanted, I was going to give them a Jedi burial, but my tears kept putting out the flame. Uh, 
it was it was because again you know the comic is there it's just there's no cover well that was what was going on with that and so uh the early uh whitmans have this diamond there um and uh later on you get a burst there instead of a diamond because they have to tell you that it's still just 35 cents uh and this is where the diamond from diamond comic distributors comes from but it is not a direct market copy and i fought a pretty big war in overstreet for about a decade because i came with i I have the receipts finally i i got i got jim shooter on record i got everybody on record these (laughs) comics only exist because of whitman because they went to uh, they went to marvel and they said, we'll buy part of the print run. We'll put this logo on. Yes, it's true that Whitman ends at just about the same time that the direct market versions of comics start up. And, and, and you will have retailers saying, well, we were able to buy these copies uh, back then. These were direct market copies. Well, yeah, they were. But basically, the comics that the direct market got were more or less sold off the back of the truck uh, in the beginning. They didn't care. They didn't have. They they weren't going to give them their own printing, uh, whereas they were willing to do it for Western, which was buying 50, 60, 70, 80 thousand copies of each issue. Uh, and so anyway, what what you get with uh, I said there were simultaneous first printings that that uh, that Whitman did for most Marvel comics, but not all. And they would hop in and out of these. Uh, they would have these three packs, and it would be whatever the three most recent issues were of something. They did not do one for Star Wars number one, as near as anybody can find, but they did include Star Wars two, three, and four. So there's a version of those. The ones that you've seen almost certainly everywhere, and this is what I got and what just about everybody else got as a kid, is the, um, is the, is the, when they went back to press with them, they did, uh, it, it, three packs of one, two, and three, and then four, five, six, and then seven, eight, nine, uh, and and they would go back to press with them repeatedly. Uh, one of the clues that we first used to prove that these were not that that that, uh, that these logos were not direct market logos is that um, for about four months in the summer and fall of 1977. No versions of those books exist for Marvel Comics, except for Star Wars. It is because Whitman went to them and they said, hey, you know that whole program where we were printing up Spider-Mans and Hulks and things like that? Forget those books. We just want Star Wars. (laughs) And they just got Star Wars, and they ended up selling between their books, between the original newsstand books at Marvel between a newsstand reprint that they did at Marvel. Uh, yeah, not even getting into the treasury edition. Uh, the, 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 the first issue uh, was the first comic book to sell a million copies in the comics industry since 1960. When, uh, when it, when, when, uh, when the number one comic book was uncle Scrooge. So <laughs> we have come full circle here. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, uh, in the price guides, Star Wars was, number one was, you know, here, $30, $40 for a good long time. But even then, uh, the collectors understood that the 35 cent variant, the test market variant, was a lot more valuable. It was a lot more important. Um, but, you know, for a long time, we were laboring under... You know, misapprehensions about the Whitman books, whether they were reprints, whether they weren't. Um, you know, they're tricky. Uh, this particular Star Wars 2, uh, 35 cent diamond cover. Well, first of all, it can't be the original because it's 35 instead of 30. Uh, but yeah, the other telltale signs are that the reprint is uh, the first two issues had uh, had UPCs and, 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 uh, and the later ones didn't. Uh, and then uh, also... Uh, there's one of the other two tells. One of the tells is that it will be uh, that reprint right up here with the box. And then the other tell, you actually have to crack this open. <laughs> it's, it you tells crack you crack it open to six, see. Is it a fourth the print or a third print? What's the final yeah. print total? Well, we, we don't know how many printings there were. 
because they would they would run more pranks. Okay, so after a while they quit. Um, they they quit putting the third fourth printing inside. Like, they, that, well, they never put second printing. What it says is, let's see if I can read it here. This is a reprint of a previously published comic book. Oh, so it doesn't. Say, okay. No, no. Why? Why would they? It's a magazine. Yeah. Why, they why would they? And, but that that actually was something that they uh, they would have had to have done special because just changing this is uh, is a very simple job for a printer. Um, what they were doing with the interior pages, they actually would have had to make an, a change on the actual printing that was going up oh, on the yeah. web. And by mm. web, I don't mean the web internet web. I mean the, the big <laughs> yeah. rollers uh, back then. Anyway, so so yeah, I mean that is kind of a, a, a snapshot of what retailing was like in the '70s and what collecting was like in the '70s and what variants were like in the '70s. Uh, you know, you're you're not looking at anything that is, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, it, it 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 there were certainly were no you know you know variant covers that they did on purpose. Nothing was done with the thought thinking of. Hey, this is collectible. This is anything like that. Uh, remember, you know, with the exception of uh, you know, uh, you know, a few, you know, uh, maybe hundred thousand fans, comics were still trash, yeah. uh, and it just happened to save Marvel Comics. It saved Marvel Comics because they were it was a license to print money there for a while. Uh, it leaps to become the number one comic book uh, of 1977, and uh, I believe of 78 as well. Uh, and this is at a time when Marvel's kind of a mess. Uh, Marvel has gone through four editors in chief uh, in swift, swift succession, uh, and it isn't until Jim Shooter gets there and basically straightens everything out, and uh, you know gets the gets the books to come out on time and the trains to run out on time and, and everything else. Uh, and uh, and you know he, he ends up being controversial with a lot of the creators in part because everybody had to start hitting their deadlines. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, but but anyway, that is that's kind of the seventies there, and that's what's tied up with that particular issue in my list of examples here. Wow, awesome! <laughs> but, uh, cl- yeah, there's cla- a lot to class, absorb there. Class dismissed. First of all, <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, oh man. That's yeah, if crazy. I didn't have access to the recording, I'd have a notebook just so I could take. Well, I mean, yeah. well, I mean, this, this is an interesting era in terms of the research on Comicron. Um, Mm. It's stuff that I've got the numbers on, but none of it's online. Yeah. Um, you know, I've got some of the 1960s there, and then I've got everything from uh, 96 forward for Diamond, and I'm filling in backwards as I go. I've got 70s stuff. Uh, it's just it's it's uh, the the sources that there are for that kind of information. It it gets dodgier and dodgier, um, and uh, and. You know, I have two different sources that are, are reliable on the 70s stuff for Marvel, for example. Um, but, you know, the, 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 it's like, these are like tools that only work some of the time and for some of the books. Um, you know, one of the things that I would use for that period is uh, you've seen in the backs of the comics, they have the statements of ownership and circulation. Uh, and that's a whole long lecture on its own, and I'll save that for another time. <laughs> but basically, they would not put those in the comics until those comics had been out for two or three years. Uh, and so you're not going to get any information about the first couple of years from Marvel of anything. Hmm. So that's that, that tool is just not even in the, in the toolkit. Um, and then there's the, uh, the Audit Bureau, which is uh, they... You, you know, comics actually used to have ads in them, uh, and people would buy ads and they would actually want to see proof that their ads actually ran in X number of copies. Uh, well, there have always been for magazines, uh, these audit bureaus that, you know, take the pledges of, you know, this is what our rate base is. This is how many people are reading these comics uh, or these magazines or whatever. And then they go in and they go into the printer and they go into the distributor and they go into the publisher's office in the dead of night and they check the books and they 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 audit literally, and uh, so this exists for Marvel, this exists for DC, this exists on and off for Harvey and Archie and various others. Uh, and you know when they don't tell the truth, they get penalized. Harvey got thrown out for about three years because you know they had overstated their sales by just a ridiculous margin. 
uh, again, you know, the, the problem, though, with that is they would always bundle sales when they were talking about them. You know, Marvel, you, you cannot go out now or 50 years ago and have your comic, uh, ha have your advertisement. Uh, yeah, give me, put, put me in an issue of Amazing Spider-Man. No, you've got to buy three million comics. You've got to buy, <laughs> you've got to buy the whole line or half the line or something like that. And so one of the things that I spent the pandemic doing is I figured out for the early 1960s what all of the groups were. And what books were in each one? So, sort of like television does that too, where it's like if you want your you want to be on the Super Bowl, you also have to buy a lot in this. the crappy news state. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but it, you can yeah. see that on their shows. Why does that commercial show up in three different things? Because that that's the show everyone watches, and yeah. the crappy three shows else. So that's, that's the same thing Marvel was doing with their incentive variants like six years ago, <laughs> where uh, you had to buy like. A hundred, yeah, to double your copies of Squirrel Girl to get yeah, the Venom variant. Yeah, twenty percent of this, and you need percent of that. <laughs> well, that, that still goes on. That's uh, yeah, the the the, uh, the platform variants and that sort of thing. But uh -huh. but yeah, that that is something which is coming eventually on Comicron. Is I I've been able to reverse engineer what a lot of this stuff was. So you know, I'm going to be able to have some sales charts for a lot of eras that never ever had sales charts. That's very really cool. I just I just need the industry to get normal for a couple of months so I can get back. Good to luck. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> then now ain't the time, bro. Not yet. <laughs> uh, no, I was I was doing fine until uh, until the uh, the numbers started coming out again, and it's just there's there's not. And I, I, I that, that's again another whole conversation, but it's, yeah, uh, with the multiple uh, distributors it's, and it's, what's yeah, the deal it's, with now. I'm I'm back in it. Yeah. <laughs> uh. Well, I'm curious, like with the Star Wars, the the first run, which is, I mean, went to 107 issues or whatever. Yeah. Like the, uh, I guess for all of us, I guess what would be what would be each of our sort of book that sort of okay, that's the one that hooked me in for the 77 uh, from the 70s on, or that's the issue, or that. I mean, of course, I mean, I don't know. For me, I'm a I'm a still Boba Fett. I mean, no, actually, I'm gonna still the uh, Marvel superheroes. Yeah, there's both right there. Like the the. Um, the true first appearance, which is the uh, paperback of Boba Fett, ah. uh, which and then also the Marvel Super Special and the Marvel, which all came out within the same month on different weeks. Well, uh, what about the newspaper pictures of him at that parade? Well, <laughs> that and, was that's, first. and that's the thing I remember most was so I got into Star Wars comics backwards, kind of. I was reading them in the newspaper and then I went and bought the Dark Horse, uh, the classics, the reprints of those. And then I went back and got all mm. the Marvel stuff. So I, I did it in a kind of a weird order, but that's that's where I picked up was right in, I guess that's the 90s, um, when they did those reprints of all the newspaper ones that I remember reading when I was a kid. Um, what you been? And then, and then, my, brother, my brother was always telling me that uh, like, the Marvel like, stuff wasn't Marvel's coming. Marvel's not that quick. Bros. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I can't tell if he's frozen or if he's done now. Did I, did I catch up? Oh um, no, 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 no! I was just saying that that I just caught up. I caught up later. I went backwards and got the Marvel stuff later. <laughs> yeah, we're right at the end, right at the right at the point of the story. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, is he freezing or what is happening? <laughs> did I freeze? Um, I'll go. I'll I'm be sorry. quick. I. I I got into Star Wars comics. Um, this is one of the first introductions I had. Um, yeah. Oh, I love it. Yeah. Um, my father was a huge collector, but I mean, Jesus. So the first movie I saw in the theaters, period, was Jedi. I was born in 78, you know, barely remember. But I mean, think about being a four or five year old and getting hit with this stuff. Like, yeah. That's you know you that's it's like the dead man. You get on the bus and you just you're there, man. Once you see this, you can't you can't go back. So that's awesome. Uh, so so J John, when did you get into writing it? Like I know you, you jumped in the dark horse, but when do you? What was your first uh, Star Wars introduction? And and I know we saw what your second book is start bringing it into the dark horse era. Yeah. Um, well, what happens with me is I I. Um, yeah, obviously, Star Wars comics go away in uh, I guess '86 because uh, it's it's the end of the license. George Lucas isn't planning on doing anymore. 
uh, and uh, what ends up happening is he gets divorced, uh, and he he ends up needing a stream of money again, and uh, he goes and licenses uh, several things that on the pro side uh, he he had already licensed the West End role playing game. Uh, he he uh, he. Just- he uh, he licenses the uh, uh, you know uh, Del Rey to start doing Timothy Zahn's novels, which use the West End role playing game as a source book. Uh, so a lot of the planet names and everything come from that. And then Dark Horse, of course, gets uh, gets in. They had already been doing Aliens, so they already had a, a relationship with Fox, uh, and and they they made a deal to uh, you know license Star Wars books. Uh, me at the same time. Uh, you know, I had been doing small press comics, you know, mini comics I'd been drawing in high school and college, edited my campus newspaper uh, it, it, uh, at the University of Tennessee. Uh, I end up, uh, I, get a, I get a master's degree in something that, uh, uh, <laughs> I was going to say, speaking of bad timing, I, uh, I, I got a Soviet studies degree, the last one offered in this country before the, the Soviet Union collapses on my dissertation. Um, Perfect for writing about the empire. There you go. There you go. No, I've used it. I've used it. Uh, but I end up. Uh, I end up. Uh, I. I. I do a year editing. Editing magazines about lumber, which uh, whatever you've heard about the lumber industry, it is not as glamorous as you th- as you think. Um, I've really? been lied to. And then I was very very lucky that all this time, you know, basically since high school, I had been subscribing to Comics Buyer's Guide, uh, the weekly newspaper uh, edited by Don and Maggie Thompson. They had an ad in the back of it that said, "We're looking for somebody to edit our trade magazine for the comics industry," uh, and that's Comics Retailer Magazine. Uh, I interviewed, came up here uh, to Wisconsin, where I've been for the last twenty-five odd odd years, uh, and I, I so I, I did Comics Retailer Magazine, which later became Comics and Games Retailer. Uh, so I, I got I got acquainted with the Dark Horse people from that magazine, and then also the Lucasfilm people from, uh, I also edited a magazine called Scry, which is the card game magazine for Magic the Gathering. <laughs> uh, and so- I'm a gaming dealer on the side. Oh, there you go, there you go. Them. Well, see, I, I, so I was dealing with Decipher, and, and you know, I, I, yep. ed, I edited a, uh, you know, a collectible magazine for Star Wars, unlicensed in that period for, uh, for the company. Um, but, uh, you know, my, my, my goal had always been uh, to kind of you know write the comics myself at some point, not necessarily Star Wars, but you know I had never written fan fiction. Something had just told me as a as a kid, you know, you want to own your rights, you want to be able to actually you know, be, publish and make money. And in fact, that was what I was doing because I had my dad's copy machine, uh, and I was doing my own comics and sending them out. I, I, I part of it was that I just couldn't draw. I mean, if I drew Iron Man, you wouldn't recognize who it was. So it was, it is, it, you know, that was that was that. But uh, you know, I had actually wanted to pitch Marvel, uh, not Marvel, but Dark Horse rather on Star Wars really early, and I'd written up a couple of plots. Uh, for some reason, I just did not uh, send it in. It did not happen until Marvel hired me in '03. Um, they did that epic thing where they were getting people to uh, submit. Mm-hmm. Uh, series ideas. They had approached me and they said, "Well, you actually seem to know how to put out a magazine. You know, maybe you can put out a comic book on time." Uh, and and what I what I pitched them again using the whole Soviet studies thing was a book called Crimson Dynamo, uh, <laughs> and, which is of course your your Russian Iron Man. Uh, yeah, I, I had no idea when I was doing this that it would be the only book that would come out from Epic that would actually finish. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, Mark Millar did uh, trouble, but that didn't count because he was already established. Uh, I was the only rookie uh, that, that had his book come out and actually finished. Trouble. That that got me Iron Man. Uh, I did that for a year uh, or so. I made I made Tony Stark the Secretary of Defense. Uh, create a few characters that wound up in the movies, which is kind of cool. Uh, but the uh, the when that ended. Um, I just was uh, taking a, a vacation in, uh, in to, to the West Coast. Uh, we had had a, a family reunion in Oregon, and I was going to go down and, uh, and go to San Diego Comic-Con the same week. Uh, and I just stopped in at Dark Horse. And I did the tour, and at the end of it, I, I saw the editor there, and I said, oh, by the way, hey, do you need anything? And, <laughs> and you know, Iron Man had opened that door, and I wrote a single issue of Star Wars Empire, uh, 
uh, with the artist who would later be my artist on uh, Knights of the Old Republic for a lot of the issues, Brian Ching. Uh, and uh, it, in 2005, at the beginning of the year, uh, you know, they approached me and they said, well, we want to do a series uh, which uses the name for Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, which is really our name uh, because we came up with it first. Uh, because it was in the uh, in the Tales of the Jedi uh, series first, uh, you know you you know have you played the game? I said no, uh, but you know does it matter? And they said no, and so <laughs> <laughs> and I did play part of it. I can never really get past Dantooine, but uh, I uh, you know I, I read what I needed to do, and I and what I did is I wrote a story about the, this kid, um, you know, the Nice Little Republic, where uh, he. Uh, uh, you know, is accused of a crime he didn't commit, and he uh, he doesn't. Uh, you know, he's not very good at what he does, but uh, he's uh, he's a decent kid, and uh, and it ends up going for quite some time. Um, you know, I used to say that it's it's Star Trek meets The Fugitive, and then you know later on it evolves into Star Trek meets Maverick. Uh, but it's okay because the same TV show creator created both The Fugitive and Maverick, uh, so it's it's uh, it's all sort of the same thing. Uh, it, but it's uh, it, it and it ended up running fifty issues in the first incarnation, fifty one technically, or fifty two, depending on how you want to look at it. Uh, and uh, and you know it's it's something where um, you know I uh, it, it's now been reprinted. I'm I'm just about to re-release my website where I've got behind the scenes pages on every issue that I've done. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, you know, transferring it to a new system that hopefully will be. I was like, wait, uh, I've read it. I've read it. I was like, what are you talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, this, is this the zero? Is it the zero in the handbook that are the fifty? Yeah, versions yeah, the zero in the handbook. Uh, and you know, it's and one of those things. It's one of those things that if you didn't know, uh, if you weren't there at the time, you would never know that zero came out after one, uh, or you would never know that uh, you know in in the reprints nine and ten are reversed. Uh, because our artist was late, and so you know, we actually you know, ten comes out before nine. The Lucian issue actually came out. Uh, it, we we called it the Flashpoint Interlude because it was in between uh, the issues of, of that. Uh, but uh, but yeah, you know, this uh, the the book comes out in January uh, two thousand six is when it starts, uh, and it's in a it's in a much different environment because by now the newsstand is down to like 10% of everything, 10, 15, depending on who it is. Uh, Dark Horse uh, is part of it. They're, they're, they're I don't know whether there are newsstand issues of, uh, of these books or not, uh, but there are, for, issue 50. There, are for, there are for some of them. There are, and I have and, a couple of uh, one. Sorry, keep going. No, it's okay. They, they set them out absolutely blindly, totally willy nilly. Uh, you know, I would go to, uh, you know, we've got uh, up here in Wisconsin. We've got a place called. Uh, uh, everybody else has Walmart or, or or Target. We've got Fleet Farm, which which is where you can go to get 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 uh, get, get slacks or shoes or parts for your tractor. Uh, and they and they also for a very long time and still do sell magazines. And they would have the weirdest comic selection where they would have nothing for comics except they would have ten copies of one Dark Horse book. Or ten copies of whatever. I would find all these, and I'm like, "Good lord, it's not really very efficient." Well, this is why the this is why the direct market killed the newsstand to begin with, because the the newsstand was just buckshot. It was just firing them everywhere. It was randomly. They had no way of knowing. Uh, so yeah, by this point, uh, yeah, that's that's what it is. Um, however, one of the ways in which um, you know this era differs from today uh, is that uh, well, let's talk about reprints. There's a reprint of issue one, and you don't know it because nobody cares about it. Why does nobody care about it? Because it's the same cover. It's the same everything. There should be a line inside, just like back in the old days, ancient, that says second printing. Uh, but we didn't advertise it. I have been looking everywhere. First of all, I can't find my copy of it, so I have probably sold uh, sold uh, sold it or something at some point without even hmm. knowing it. Uh, secondly, I can't find any record of Diamond actually ever having offered it. Uh, so, but I but I and I've and I've gone through my email. 
I swear I was told about it. I swear I had one. I swear I went through. I swear I saw it. Uh, but somebody's going to find that, and they're going to. It's think right it's next to my rocket firing Boba Fett that I got it, in the mail. No, it might. It, it, it's it's worth looking at, but I mean, I I can tag it. It's probably you know, uh, there's there's probably a couple of thousand of them. It's not, and that's not. The thing is, that's not that significantly lower than the sales figures were anyway. Uh, what the notes? Yeah. What the notes it? So what, how does one tell? Indicia. Barcode? No, Indicia. Just, oh, it's Indicia. Indicia. Okay. Just okay. that. Just, 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 a little, just, a little, just a little line. There's an, every, everybody watching this guy. We all want to rock our While you right say that, let me look. Look. <laughs> uh, And I, 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 I'm telling you, I'm not crazy. I just can't find it. Yeah, I've gone through my emails and everything, and I just uh, no. You should feel good if you don't have it because I mean, it's, it's stupid first print. First printing, so it, it should be fine. But but anyway, yeah. I mean, uh, but we didn't do anything special with reprints then either because the logic of reprints was still it's a reprint. Who cares? Yeah. Uh, it was it was you know not don't do anything special for them. We begin to start moving this way uh, in this period a little bit, but it's mostly still repackagings. The Marvel must-haves. I don't know if you remember those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, okay. it's, it's the same book, but they'll put a different cover on it, and they'll probably jam a second book in there. It's not the same book at that point. Uh, so, so anyway, yeah. Uh, the uh, so that's 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 kind of what uh, that's kind of what the the back market is in this era for this kind of stuff. Um, you know, it's these books, um, I can tell you for sure, there isn't a Dark Horse book, uh, you know, published in the 2000s uh, that, uh, you know, during the 2000s was worth much. I mean, it just, it's, I'm trying to think of the, the Purge. Purge was the one, I think. Mm -hmm. That yeah. was, that was where it was a one shot. Nobody expected it. And it's Darth Vader running around killing characters that uh, had names uh, that that you know we, that uh, you know we were important, and that was a John Ostrander book. Uh, but that was pretty much it. I I can't remember uh, any of the series uh, you know really catching fire in, in the aftermarket back then. Well, there's an Adam. There's an Adam Hughes cover on one of those issues, ladies and gentlemen. If you're Adam oh, Hughes collectors, yeah. yeah. But on on Knights of the Old Republic, did the print run increase? Like I, the, I know, like one, two, and three were like a, there. There wasn't as big of it was a big print run, or because it went fifty issues, so you had to have grown in your fan base. I well, mean, the the thing, th couple of things to keep in mind. Uh, first of all, let's be very careful about the word print run. Everybody throws it at me all the time. <laughs> That's not what's on Comicron. Yeah, what's on Comicron is the number of copies that were shipped. That's uh, or, or the number of copies that were sold. Uh, they weren't sold to consumers. They were sold to retailers. They don't mm. come back. But they're not. You know, the print run is going to be a figure above that. No matter yep. what it is, they're keeping yep. something back to cover damages or something like that. Uh, and of course, back in the newsstand days, print run is way up here because yeah. you've got all the all the newsstand issues in there. But everybody uses it, and that's you know, so. I, it's. Uh, but, well, so it's uh, a lot I, harder to say retailer purchased issues. Print run just comes off the tongue. Say it, sales. Copy, I will copy, tell you what real copy quick. sold or, or, or confirmed ship copies. Okay. One of the guys on the site writes in sites Comicron, and he states very clearly the numbers below, just like the site, the numbers below are um, sold copies. Yeah. Or sold to distributor copies. Like, well, so, you know, sold to not use the word print run. Sold, sold to retail. retail. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the sets, and again, article. it depends on when you're looking yeah. at it. You need to look at the the fine print is at the top of every uh, every chart. Mm. Uh, in 2003, Diamond shifts to just printing a number that is what they shipped out of the warehouse or, or the warehouses in North America. That's all. That's that's what that is at that point. Those books aren't coming back unless you see the asterisk. And that is why things are so fouled up right now. And again, they're fouled up for a good reason, uh, because the publishers came to the rescue of retailers by making all these books returnable. 
But I can tell you that last the last month for which we have the charts out, which is September, there's like 125 returnable books out of 500 there. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why you don't see actual numbers on yeah. Comicron currently. Uh, they're just not possible. Uh, it's <laughs> it's 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 uh, it's a very very moving target right now. But but yeah, uh, that's uh, so yeah the 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 uh, the 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 um, the numbers that are on there, those are ship copies. And I'm sorry, what was the original? <laughs> so did the sales go up? Okay, or... yes. All right. So so what what happens here is um, the first year is really strong. The second year it starts to trail off like they do. Yeah. Uh, and, but the dynamic is always every graphic novel that comes out that that's a boost to the system that jazzes sales. And uh, at the beginning of 2007, uh, you know, Randy Stradley came to all of us, um, well, all of us meaning me and, and Jan Ostrander, uh, John Ostrander and Jan Sema over on Legacy and said, let's actually do a, a crossover event uh, okay. so that we can jazz everything at once. Uh, the, literally, the email was uh, titled "The Same Idea." Uh, we want to be able to do the same idea that Marvel and DC do, uh, and and there was no way to do it because we didn't have time travel in Star Wars. But we worked like... it out, and it, it took us about a year to get the idea together. And um, one of the reasons that uh, you know the book gets late uh, in uh, in two thousand seven is because I have to go back to the well four times to actually get what would end up being called vector uh, mm, you know, so into, a, into a workable thing. Well, I, I appreciate that. That's the reason, incidentally, that vector number one is the highest circulation, co not vector number one, vector's first chapter, issue 25. That is the highest mm. circulation issue, and that one's got a second printing. Maybe. That's the last issue I needed to complete my Knights of the Old Republic run. I needed I need, a 25. I need, to look, I need to look that one up because I I, tw I believe 25 has a second printing too. So, uh, I mean, it, it, or it and could it be on... Again, it's not in the barcode. It's only in the... In the, in the it would only be in the edition because, because the barcode, I mean, there's no there's no reason for it to change. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Ben's in my head just exploded. We all are frothing at the mouth to go check our long boxes I for second like printing. Although, although, once again... Uh, I get this on Twitter. <laughs> I get this on Twitter. Caring about second printings goes against forty years of comics collecting logic. It does. It, it does. does. Of course it does. Doesn't mean I don't want to check. No, that's cool. <laughs> and look, I obviously care. Of anybody, the guy running Comicron cares about <laughs> scarce things really being scarce. One of the reasons that Comicron exists is because when I showed up to run Comics Retailer Magazine. It was the fall of 1993. The market had peaked in the summer of 1993, and we had eight years of misery coming that I had to see the business through where we we're dealing with the flaming wreckage of, and and again, you know, I, we talked about you be coming on a different time to get into some of the why and wherefore of some of these other periods, but, you know, part of what was going on, Speculation did not cause the collapse in the '90s. It was it was not thing A. It was an an accelerant. It aggravated it, and one of the things that hurt us was that there was no reliable way for fans to find out that this thing wasn't rare, that this thing wasn't, uh, you know, uh, uh, that that you know that there are eight million copies of X Men Volume Two Number One. Uh, <laughs> Somebody bought five thousand copies. We know they did. Uh, it, it, we, you know, the, the, somebody had a receipt, <laughs> and, and and it's just they. But but that information was not there. And as long as uh, you know, as long as there's any element of the business that is making money off of the perceived rarity of things, we need to be transparent about it. I think the publishers should want to be more transparent about it. Uh, then, and uh, because clearly you guys are all searching for it. Um, you know, I have some features coming out on Comicron if I ever get the time uh, <laughs> that will do a lot of the legwork that a lot of people have been doing. Uh, there's already a page on there, which is 
uh, all which lists every second, third, and fourth printing of of the year. Uh, I've got that going back some years now, and mm -hmm. I should be able to put pretty decent numbers to each of these things uh, that I've been able to parse out from from you know. I've got a lot of stuff you don't see. I've got mm -hmm. a lot of data that you know is some of it is just not in any shape to show anybody. And then some of it is stuff that I've been given that, you know, I, I can't, uh, you know, publicly release. Uh, now, is, that can, 90s, oh, sorry. Yeah. Is, is that 90s crash the impetus behind you beginning Comicron? Is that why you did it well, to make sure at, it wouldn't happen again? Well, I, I was at, I was at, I was at comics retailer magazine. The, the, the real impetus was, uh, we have a distributor war in uh, the distributor war start in, in 95. Uh, you know, and again, that's also another very long digression, which I won't get into, but the, the long Heroes and the short of it time. is that Marvel, Marvel blows up the distribution system. Uh, and during that period, which lasts from, uh, the, uh, t technically from, uh, September of 95 to, uh, September or to August of 96, there's a one-year period where it is not possible to build a uh, top 300 list uh, from uh, from everything without taking multiple distributors' flows of data and putting them together. And Marvel didn't publish any data at Heroes mm -hmm. World. And so it was not until, and this is where the emphasis is, Marvel realizes that there are good reasons to have these charts out there. The, the reason that the charts initially started at Capital City Distribution with those order and index numbers in the 80s was to tell retailers, hey, the guy across the street, the guy across the country is making a lot of money with a book about turtles. Is making a <laughs> lot of money. Now, really, it was, it, the, 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 this, is what you, it, this is what you should be getting. And if you were a new comic shop, what should you be ordering? If you're a new comic mm -hmm. shop, you should take this list. And these are the relative levels you should order these things at. And that was what was in the capital charts. Diamond begins aping the capital charts with those things in the early 90s. Uh, but then we get to uh, we get to this split here. Marvel has no data at all. Uh, Marvel discovers, well, there's a PR loss of not having themselves appearing to be first in the business, which they were. Uh, and and also, you know, there's there's there isn't this menu effect that the retailers were able to add, uh, go from. And, and mm. so what happens is uh, Marvel and I approach each other in uh, the summer of 96. Uh, and the idea is to let's get some information out of Marvel. Heroes World provides me data uh, that ends up being in uh, the comics retailer magazine. Uh, and, uh, over the years, comics retailer, I continue to do that even after I'm no longer editing the magazine. Uh, it, it ends up moving to Comics Buyer's Guide's website in addition to that uh, in the in the mid-2000s. Uh, and then basically we talked about 2007, that busy year when I'm you know working on Vector and <laughs> Coder and Indiana Jones and everything else that's out there. And that's also when I wrote the original draft of the Kenobi novel. Uh, you know, that's, uh, it was going to be a graphic novel. No, there's no art. Don't look for it. Uh, but, but, but I, 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 that was when I quit the day job because I had so much going on. And, um, and so, uh, that's, I, I started Comicron, uh, it launched, uh, the day after I, uh, I was out of the building. And the, the idea was, as you said, um, I wanted to both preserve the work that I had done, which was uh, in addition to the magazines, it was also this big massive book called the the uh, the uh, the uh, standard catalog of comic books, which if I put on one of the top shelves here would cause the thing to collapse. Uh, yeah, here we go. That was that's that's the standard catalog of comic books. That is that's the, nice. That is the biggest book ever published about comics, sixteen hundred and some odd pages. It's a doorstop. You could kill a small child with this. I don't recommend it, uh, but I mean, it's it's just it's just, and, and it was our it was, well. The, the the goal with that book was to actually do a do a uh, do a do an overstreet 
except every issue would be listed individually. Uh, and that's what it was. Okay. And I also had my sales figures in there. And um, I say they're mine because they're mine because they're, they're numbers. I worked on them. Uh, they're mine. Uh, and <laughs> and I can, uh, you know, I, I, yeah, I mean, the, the, the data is the data. So uh, so anyway, the uh, uh, so, I, yeah, I, I, I just kept doing the numbers. And uh, it's it's been a monthly thing since uh, since September 96. Uh, it was only broken in April, that record of, of doing it every month as they came out. Although, as you see on my website, you know, I, I went to plan B and plan C. <laughs> so there are some estimates there, uh, you know, for some of the months and, uh, and there will eventually be more data on them. Okay. Uh, but, but anyway, this is all a field of Star Wars, but that's, that, that is, that is one <laughs> of the reasons that I, I, I have the site there is I think that the, the, the retailers need this information and I think that the customers have a right to it. Uh, because in other collectible fields, and we're a collectible field, whether people want it to be or not, we're both. We're an art form, and we're a collectible. And you have a right, if you're going to buy a Mona Lisa, to know how many other copies there are. Yeah. It's a great point. Yeah. That is a great point. Very Speaking true. Speaking of I'm one's information, of we got a couple of questions about Coder for you. I was going to yeah. say, I'm going to circle and you right started to get Star into Wars. one. You started to get into one before we pressed record. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, so that's where I'm going to head because there's so many, like, again, I literally finished, Do I finished issue about 15. This one? Yeah, but it starts before then because, first of all, respect to issue three. Like, <laughs> Jerio, however you say it. Jero, it, yeah. was good, it was good to hear you say Lucian, too, because in my head I have that, but you hear people say, oh, Lucian. Oh, yeah, that's a good like, ah. It's whatever it is. Whatever it is, but oh, hearing you're the right. writers say it, at least I'm like, yeah. I thought, right. Um, yeah, so uh, Revan, Malik. I know nobody talks Malik. Everyone wants to talk Revan. I'm just going to stop there and let you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, what I said before the opening was that uh, everybody's got, uh, and I keep hearing about this, uh, uh, everybody's got Revan's first appearance wrong, but it may not be a thing where anybody cares. <laughs> it's, um, they care. <laughs> they, Revan's first uh, Revan's can't. first appearance is actually right here, the uh, in the in the twenty five cent issue, which I had a thousand copies of not just a decade ago because we I got them as giveaways and I've been giving them away for decades or <laughs> for a decade. Uh, and Revan is here in this crowd scene. Uh, let's, let's see if I can get up there. Here, let me make it. I'll make it. Yeah, Revan is the hooded guy in the crowd scene there. Uh, <laughs> Did yeah, you just right a random guy out. Yeah, you, well, you can uh, see here. No, I was like, oh, I can see someone? him. <laughs> I can see him. Yeah, yeah. So it's, when uh, it, Rowan's, Rowan's one of the guys here in the crowd scene here, and, and it's you could tell it's the the hood there. Uh, yeah, because Revan has come with Malik to visit Zane's master. I'm and, only laughing because Topher and I had this conversation. We're like, is he in that panel? Oh, he is. But man. you know what? You know what? <laughs> Who cares? He's tiny. This is, uh, and again, this is a discussion which I got into with somebody on on uh, on Twitter the other day. Is is people are chasing these first appearances? Then here more recently, and I know some of this comes from, you know, I, and I talked to to uh, you know, uh, Nick Kawianis, uh, the uh, the the, uh, the the key comics guy, and I know that people are chasing a lot of stuff that never used to be valuable catalogs and ads and things like mm -hmm. that and things which i always say you know if, the, if it hasn't been valuable for 45 years and you now think it is somebody's wrong and you have to you, and and you could be right but either all of us were wrong for 45 years and 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 you're right now or or not and i just i i think what what you, what I think people miss to a degree about this is, and I'm a writer, so I'm saying this, it's the story that makes these characters important. It is the story that makes these moments important. I've got a Wolverine uh, first appearance in Incredible Hulk 180. There is no reason in the world to believe that that is more important than Wolverine's first story 
in Incredible Hulk 181. And Cubs. that is that is the story that establishes who he is, creates his character for everybody. The other is just a sketch. And uh, the way that I liken it, and and I get it, but that's at least in a comic book. That's a cameo in a comic book. That's that's still better than this character is appearing in an ad in a comic book, or worse, an ad in a catalog. If catalogs are important, I've had truckloads of catalogs that had to be pumped. (laughs) But I know it's at and and the way that I look at, at that kind of stuff. There are people who collect that in other fields too. Mm-hmm. But it's collected as advertising collectibles. It's it's uh, it's uh, for example, um, well the, the 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 analogy I look at is what would you rather have? Would you rather have the Porsche or would you rather have the brochure for it? <laughs> One came first. <laughs> I bet you'd like the car. <laughs> it's and it's not that the it's not that the brochures aren't really viable. Yeah, I'm sure the original brochure for the original Carmen Ghia that came out 30, uh, 30 weeks before the car came out, I'm sure those are actually things people buy and sell. I mean, I've, I've been to the car shows. I've been to all sorts of things. It's just, you know, the, 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 you know there should be like a, you know, it, you would think that would be like a hundred times more valuable than that first sketch or that first appearance or that yeah. first whatever. It is a fun thing. It is a fun thing to collect them, and it's I think cool. at, at a low, fun. at a I'm low cool. bar. No, I'm, I'm 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 cool with that. It, it's just when you see some of the stellar numbers that some of these things rack up, uh, yeah. it, it, you begin you to go. That today, somebody shared that preview of Miles. Did you guys see that in our chat? Seven seven thousand seven thousand dollars for a okay, preview so for preview. That's a school of no, money. And I, was, and, I was, and I was like, wow, you know the the. the the, the, it, if it was stu- if it was something that retailers who knew who Miles Morales was didn't keep, that they af- after he was if it was famous until a month ago or, or, or I mean, if, it, if it wasn't famous until a month ago this one particular appearance I, I just I just you know I, I get very cautious uh, again part of this comes from you know when I was at Comics Buyer's Guide. Uh, we were part of what was, while it existed there, uh, we were the world's largest publishing company about collectibles. We had cars, we had records, we had sports cards, we had toys, we had everything. We had basically experts that roamed from field to field or had, you know, in fact, that was my last couple of jobs there was I was running, uh, I was editorial director for the collectibles division. And we were able to see here are the dynamics that are at work in all of these things. We have locusts that go from field to field. So the sports card guys would hop into comics and then hop into magic cards and then hop into Beanie Babies and then hop into... And so we would see things flare up where something would suddenly get popular because a light was shined on it. And that was what happened in the 90s because of Wizard Magazine. Wizard Magazine starts shining lights on specific things that get really hot for a moment and then you never hear of them again uh you know valiant explodes and then you can't give the valiant books away uh <laughs> there there's just a whole lot of that going on at that time and we see it happening now faster with you know there are apps and there are websites and there are other things and there's also the hard data that i was hoping we would get uh and we have been getting i mean the the price guides that we did in Comics Buyer's Guide and for uh, the standard catalog, you know, that was har- we were harvesting eBay prices for all of that. We were harvesting all the CGC sales. Well, now, of course, you got we've had for all this time, we have G- GP analysis, which actually is tracking all of that stuff. That's great. I would rather have these things based on some information than no information. Uh, it's just, you know, you have to keep in mind, it only takes two people to make a market. And this is a di- this is a dynamic that has been around for a long time in comics. Where um, you know, I remember we would we would we would get the new Overstreet every year, and we would just flip through it, and we, our jaws would just drop at this section or that section where we would say, "Okay, we know what's going on," and this is no fault of Overstreet's, but we would know what was going on. 
it's they've got these three advisors who are the only people who truck in this stuff. And there may not be anybody who collects it, but you know, they don't want the inventory to be devalued. Uh, and they probably are actually racking up those sales to one another, uh, you know, when they're sending the reports, but you know, there's a, there's a long stretch in there where you can, you can just look at the Dennis, the menace prices and say, okay, was there really anybody spending a hundred dollars on an issue of Dennis, the menace in these particular years in any condition? Uh, you, you know, you, and, and you kind of wonder and now, you know, that's the other part of this is we, we've got, we've got the supply numbers from Comicron and we've got, you know, the sale numbers from eBay and other places. Uh, so there's more information than there was. It's just, I'm always, you know, you know buy what you like to read. The collecting yep. part is fun, but just be careful. Yeah. Well, we get into like some semantics there too. Like, you know, Peter is showing his Clone Wars one there. I've got mine behind me. Yeah. But this isn't this isn't even nearly the first appearance of Ahsoka Tano. I mean, yeah. she's got she's in a TV guide before this. She's in a, a Grosset and Dunlap, arguably a trade paperback comic book two months before that issue. Yeah. You know, she's so you know we're t we're talking about it as a first comic book appearance, but you know when we're getting into semantics here, this is but this is the first time yeah. she's she's in the story. Yeah. I mean. The, this starts to solidify her character for the first time outside yeah. of the cartoon, at least. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, so. you know, in a crowd scene, how much should in a crowd scene be worth? I mean, you know, how much should in a should role only be, worth be worth what you want to pay? Yeah. No, yeah. nine. I am. I am. And again, I, I, I appreciate the site that I own. Yeah. I appreciate the Topher in the market like nine. There is nothing. I, I no nine, even zero. No, forty-two. All based on what you said earlier. Story forty-two is where not only you this one, with the map, <laughs> right, but the story gets told from no, that's, Malik. That's and that's that's legitimate. Writing. And that's legitimate. That's and that's where I live. And that, everyone's that, like, "Yeah, nine. nine. I'm like, "That well, uh, forty-two has uh, well." Uh, 42 has the benefit of being, I want, I want to call it a benefit, 42 is down near the end where the sales are worse. So there's not as many copies. Uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, but, you know, also, you know, the, uh, the paper stock is a little better at that point, and, and so you're, you're more likely to get a better copy. Um, but, the story, uh, but, though. The wonderful no, that, story. I, yeah, I, I love writing the story. I, that nine, was, uh, nine was my favorite single issue that, of that year, probably. So, I mean, that was... Although it was, it was uh, it was originally supposed to be ten. <laughs> well, no, I'm only obsessive compulsive, so I want the nine. I want forty two. I want you. I just want them all, not because I want to sell them or say, hey, this is the first whatever. I don't care about first cameo. I don't care about first full. I just want the appearances because I just want them for my collection because I just think it's cool to have it. And that's well, the way I, I collect too. I'm the same way. I'm like, if I you can know, afford this is something it, that I, I read. I don't want to be. I don't want to be caught with my pants down when this thing's worth three, four, five thousand dollars, and I've, I don't have a copy of a book that I read. That pisses me off. So. Well, I've. Uh, I, I. I. Again, it, 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 it. I. I think it's amazing. I mean, I've had cases of these books. And I still have cases of these books. Uh, I. I will eventually. <laughs> I've, I've talked to my retailer every so often about doing a six, signature series kind of a thing. Uh, where it would not be just me, but everybody who wants to send a, is send anything in. Uh, but but yeah, I mean, I literally I I think the uh, the the forty it's either the nine or the forty two that is uh, that sold for crazy numbers here recently. I signed on the very last day of the very last convention that I've gone to since the pandemic. Uh, so mm. <laughs> it's uh, it's like if I if I had known it was going to go for that much, I probably would have charged the guy a buck. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no one can guess some of these prices. My Coder One, which I can't find, um, yeah. is signed. It's a 98 SS signed by you. Oh well, that's uh, it's, that's 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 all. That's that's very cool. Again, you know, I love it. it well, it's, it's I mean, the, the, the important thing I think is is you know, if it wasn't a story that people like, nobody should care. Nobody should care. I mean, if it's yeah. if it's uh, so I I. I'm much happier it being this series than 
some of the others that I might have written that I'm not as actually, you know, gung-ho about. Well, there, and there's the feed-in, right, of the people who really loved the game. That game was an award-winning game. People remember the, oh, the yeah. nostalgia oh, yeah. of playing the game and then reading the comic, too, and then they kind of link together, and now we're oh, like, yeah. well, we get this in live action. So there's some real there's some real headway around we buy these, too. Like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yep. Oh, I mean, there's a uh, there's, uh, – well, actually, that – you want to the, the the rarest Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic comic that's not one of those reprints is coming right here. Oh boy, <laughs> coming at you first from CBSI, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> oh, there we go. It's that one. That's oh, uh, that's, boy. that's issue six. That's in the uh, that's in the comic pack. And under no circumstances should you open. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it was a, it was an exclusive entertainment earth with Jarrell and uh, and Roland. Uh, and yeah, I did open I opened one so I could actually get to the action figures, but uh, but that was uh, that was at the end of the um, that was at the end of the uh, comic packs that they did. Uh, oh, did not wow. go to Walmart, did not go anywhere else. Uh, they did the, like the last six they did just did exclusives for entertainment Earth. And so that issue six that's in there, is uh is you know there's no let's see there's there's no there's no price on it there's uh there's you know it's pretty obvious what it is yeah. um and uh that it's that it doesn't belong with it. it it's up there with the golden record spider-man which uh which oh. i i have which i have one of which i always use to fake people out they, they think it's the real one. <laughs> i have the fantastic four and the avengers four of those oh very good so <laughs> They're even harder to find when paired with the record. Like, oh, I don't have the record. Yeah, I always keep in the lookout for those toy, the toy issues in uh, dollar bins because they usually get thrown in there. Half the time they're beat up, but it's a weird issue to stuff. put in there. But, but I, I know why they did it. I mean, you, you look at that, and that's, that's the end of a storyline. It's the last issue of a storyline. But it's 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 an issue where both Jarrell and Roland. Actually, that is Roland's first appearance. Is in that at the very so, end. Yeah. So yeah, in its uh, first well, well, season. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. What what'd you say? It's first oh, season. Uh, ha, yeah, Hazen. I'm yeah. sorry, Hazen. No, 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 that's okay. no, no, that's okay. It's it's whatever you think it is. Fifty fifty. Hey, it, it was not until I started doing the novels, uh, like my my Star Trek novels, my Star Wars novels. It wasn't until I started doing them and they had audiobooks that I actually had to start providing had, official pronunciations. Yeah. So then you're getting you're getting personal calls from Pablo Hidalgo going. Uh, that's not how yeah. you say it, John. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no. I, 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 I had to. Well, and in fact, uh, the Kenobi novel. Uh, there's some, the, you know, the the uh, the uh, the artist uh, or the narrator pr pronounces some of the names differently, and I'm like, okay, well, that's the official version now. That's it now. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, the, the Star Trek ones are fun to do because uh, you know, I, I actually, I did a, I did a Klingon trilogy where. I worked with a Klingon language instructor to create a lot of new sentences and words, and he sent he sent like he sent a recording to the guy that recorded the audio book, and it was it's 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 always like one of those Berlitz things where it's all right. Bortash beater, Revenge is a dish best served cold, and he would say it over and over and over again until you got it right. So. Did you actually say that right? Is no, that God, is no. that real? Bortash bir jabludich I think is it, but I don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah give you a Peruski. I, I only speak a little Russian. <laughs> I, I was say, wait a second. <laughs> You're using your master's degree on us and trying to fool us and tell us this thing on. <laughs> well, that was that was another cool thing, which is one of the one of the Kenobis on my shelf here uh, is, and actually, you want a really rare Knights of the Old Republic. I've got it in Russian over here. Um, oh wow! And they translated the whole thing, and the, the translators are in regular touch with me uh, about cool. you know the pronunciations of things. So nice. so yeah, when they when they, they they they'll send me the Russian versions of the comics, and I'll sign them in Russian, and I send them back. To them. That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, Chris, you got a yeah third so. Book? We your third book and oh yeah, is, yeah let me get to that <laughs> but we're this is gonna you can easily send us down some rabbit holes because we all have opinions on I'll, Star Wars I'll, I can one. hit it real quick but it's, okay it was just Star Wars number one in 2015 we know we're in a different realm at this point this is Marvel doing uh, Star Wars uh, and by this point there is no newsstand 
Uh, by this point, Marvel has left it, so there's none of that. Uh, we have uh, instead, uh, we have a variant cover market that actually uh, is is robust. It involves copies being sold. Uh, you know, there, there are the platform variants attached to it, I'm sure, mm -hmm. but there were also retail specific variants that went to specific stores. Uh, and uh, there is one particular variant that just wrecks everything for about a year around that period in the sales charts. Uh, and that is the loot crate uh, oh. stuff uh, because because that was during when that fad was going on. And I just want to say, you know, when I, when I, when I get like playing Mr. Old Guy with you know, this, <laughs> you kids don't know this isn't really collectible because I've seen things come and go. I said like 90 times in the Comicron notes every time these things came out. And just so you know, grab bags have been around in comics forever, and nobody has ever thought that they were worth getting. Uh, <laughs> that during the whole box thing, where it was a mm. gift box of all of these yeah. different things. Was it Luke uh, Ray did it? And then there's a Collector's Corp one with the Funko also, hat. There, there are 78 different versions of Star Wars number one Jeez. as of when Great. the book came out. And Loot Crate... Wow. Loot Crate Loot Crate kicks in over 400,000 copies. Um, Holy crap! <laughs> Are you serious? Loot Crate kicks in over 400,000 copies. Loot Crate is, is, the, is the reason that in the Diamond Charts that month, which is January of 2015... Uh, instantly, January is a pretty good month for a series to start, even though the sales usually suck that year, that month because of the time of year. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the most of the publishers go dark; they don't publish as much stuff. Yeah. So that's when Knights of the Old Republic one came out. Uh, we we actually ranked a lot higher than we would have if everything else had been out for the summer. Because <laughs> there's well, less competition. So <laughs> so so when that issue came out, uh, it was it was uh, every seventh comic book that Diamond sold in January. Uh, what or shipped was uh, uh, Star Wars one. Uh, it was the first comic book to uh, hit a million since uh, Batman 500. Or if you want to count them, uh, Pokemon: The Electric Tale of Pikachu one through four, which came out in 1999. Uh, and if you want to, if you want to hate, uh, if you want to hate uh, 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 anything in collecting. <laughs> Hate those books because Viz put nothing in them saying that they were reprinted. Uh, reprinted dozens of times. Oh. Nothing in there. They put out a press release saying, we've sold over a million copies of each of them. And we're all great. Yeah, the first one, you know, the, the first one would have been really valuable uh, because that was back when retailers didn't know Pokemon was going to be a big deal. Yeah. Um, and same with the card game. Uh, the retailers just didn't order any of them, and then it turned out to be a monster, and 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 it went from there. Uh, uh, the, uh, no pun intended, uh, monster. <laughs> uh, but but yeah, I mean, so so yeah, Star Wars one. Uh, you know, it 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 kind of gets over that million line with the asterisk of you've got these copies from Loot Crate out there, which again I think are sort of, and it's not just Star Wars; it's all of them. Nobody really yeah. went out and made an effort to buy 400,000 copies of these things. They just got them when they signed up for this box. And so so you've got you've got you've got uh, you've got all the sales charts for about a year and a half in there. Every other one has a you know an, an issue where it just goes crazy uh, in the charts. And in fact, it's the reason that we didn't get end of year sales charts, official ones for 2016, uh, because uh, you know it. it they, I, I think I think they that my assumption is the reason we didn't see them is because according to my math, it was big trouble in Little China slash Escape from uh, Escape from New York number one, uh, which was the top selling comic book of the year. Only because of Loot Crate. Not only because of Loot Crate, but 95% of the copies were Loot Crate copies. And if you, if, if that matters to you, 
uh, to be, you know, in first place. Well, that was that would be something that you would be concerned about. I will say though that um, you know, I'm glad we have those numbers. I want those numbers out there. I want those numbers out there for the reason that Mike was mentioning earlier. We want to know if something's real, really rare or not. And if there are 400,000 copies sitting someplace else, uh, you know, of something. It makes you wonder, why did they make seven printings of that book, considering how many they made? Well, well, so, yeah, seriously. Well, because they, they sold out. Or they, or, or you know, that's... Because they could. Yeah, yeah. they yeah. wanted to make different color covers. They wanted to make more money. It's the one situation one. where being first is actually being last. And, and this, this thing, I I do not, you know, a, a, a lot of a lot of people are down on variants. I I don't think there's anything morally wrong with variants. I think in a world in which you can have a tele, in, in a world in which you can order your car in any color, uh, and with any different number of options, uh, on the internet. Yeah, I mean, I mean, consumers like choices. And if I'm going to pay $10 for the anniversary issue of Batman or Wonder Woman or whatever else, I ought to be able to get one with a cover I like. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I want the rights in. And that's cool. And having limited run variants, that's cool too, because what it does is it funnels that traffic, those dollars, towards that. Uh, that part of the market, and it sort of insulates the overall publisher uh, and the overall title uh, from any of the crazy ups and downs that we had in the early '90s. Uh, you know, where where they didn't have the ability to do a print run of just a thousand. They yeah. they could only do you know half the run this way or half the run that way, and so everything looked rare, but really wasn't. Uh, so so yeah, I, I, I don't the rights. But- yeah, so so I mean, this is this is this is. You know, I don't I don't have that that big of an issue with with it. It's it's simply when it does start to misshape the market is when you have a lot of these you were mentioning before the 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 ones where you have the hoops to go through. Retailers have to buy a hundred copies of this to get a copy yeah. of that. Yeah, that makes it tough. Yeah. Um, you know, that's a great perspective, though. I haven't heard anybody really say that perspective anywhere, is, and that's th- th- yeah, that they're not hurting anything; that they're really just an option to keep the market alive and kicking, rather than bringing it down. It's interesting. Most well, people don't uh, say it that. Well, way. well, no, there, there, there have to be. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of different kinds of customer. There are comics <laughs> customers who are interested in Spider-Man, who are only interested in paying the. Two ninety nine or whatever it is to get the digital yeah. version. There are the ones who are interested enough that they want the actual comic book, but uh, only in graphic novel format. There are ones that want the actual physical comic book, but there are ones who want the experience to be bigger and better and have the wallets to be able to go that way. The mm-hmm. VIP ticket at the convention. Um, that's okay. That's okay if you can find a way to let that happen but not screw over everything else in the process. Uh, and, you know, it, the dynamics of the system, the, the system's dynamics work really well in comics. You know, what is a benefit of having a series that goes 50 issues long? Each individual issue has to make less money because by that point, we've got these graphic novels over here. They're, uh, they're making money for it. I would get... Just you know, all these messages, to, you know, you're tagging me about Ms. Marvel, this or that or the other thing. You know, look at the sales numbers on that, and I would just say, oh, you kid, they're hmm. making millions of dollars on this property. There, there, it does. <laughs> when once you've got eight graphic novels out that are selling better in the newsstand market in the book channel market than there are you know, even in our market. And they're still doing pretty good in our market too. Uh, they're, they're, I think by a year and a half ago, there had been 500,000 Ms. Marvel graphic novels sold. At that point, it doesn't matter if you make any money on the individual issues at all. The purpose of the issues is a delivery system to get the creator to finish the next book. 
and they advertise the next book. And, you know, it's, it's it, at, at that point, it's almost more valuable as an ad on the wall uh, yeah. and, and, and as a make work program yeah. to keep the creator working. Because I got to tell you, that, that, that 1,280 page issue uh, comic book, The Knights of the Old Republic there, I could not have gone away and written that in one session. <laughs> It's the it's the char it's oh, the really? Charles Dickens it's the Charles Dickens model. That's exactly what it was. It, created it back the serial back in the 1830s, and it's still alive and kicking now. That's exactly it makes what a lot of sense. It's a reason why comics are now paced for trade. Like, why do we get yeah. these arcs that are five to six issues I, it's, that it's, are easily collected to be sold we, again? We are we are the healthiest part of the magazine business, and we're the healthiest part of the book business at the same time. We're mm -hmm. the healthiest part of the magazine business because we are the magazines that people keep. They don't throw them away. We're also the healthiest part of the magazine business because people will buy our content again. Who wants a collected issue, or a bound collection of Time magazine? They, you know, they'll do the CD-ROMs or whatever, but that's no, people don't. There are a few, but not many. Yeah, there are a few, but I mean, this is this is, uh, you know, we're 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 we're, you know, we're so so, uh, and also we're the healthiest part of the magazine business because we have a direct market that sells to all of our customers pre-sold and almost all of our customers they 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 don't have to actually uh uh you know the the, the yeah you know, i'm a collector of tv guide it's a sickness i i know i got a thousand <laughs> copies you frank you know, santa uh, you want know, no there, there you go there, that's if you if you if you uh, it's yes yeah, the today it's the today show issue that uh, he's looking for. uh Th that that's a market where you get the really seriously uh, obsessed people because they don't just want the issue from uh, uh, you know from the particular week, they want the North Dakota issue from the particular week. Oh yeah, because oh. <laughs> because there are <laughs> there are a hundred and ninety one versions of the of the magazine, uh, depending yeah. on you know what year it is. Uh, but yeah, what did TV Guide had that helped us for so many years? More than half the copies were pre sold. They were sold by subscription. Subscription, yeah. But stupid kids well, have knocked on your door. So subscriptions, you subscriptions never were very big in comics. They were never more than you know five percent. Yeah. Uh, but it, it was it, it, with the exception of a few books like Barbie, where you know they actually had a thing with the uh, you know a, a, a promotion with the toy manufacturer. Uh, but but the comic shops are the subscription agent. The comic shops are, are buying that stuff outright. So, so yes, comics, our model is in great shape relative to other magazines. And then again, relative to books, uh, you know, we're, 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 we're able to serialize. We're able to actually sell a work in progress. We are already a Kickstarter for all of our books. Yeah. We're all, yeah. we're a comic. The comic book is a crowdfunded mechanism for creating graphic novels. Yeah, and, keep funding it. We'll keep making it. Yeah, stop yeah. funding it. Well, and and you know, every time they say, "Let's get rid of the comic book," it's like, "Are you guys aware?" The last time I counted, and this is back again when I had the numbers when I was doing the price guide. So we're talking fifteen years ago. The last math I had when I was able to run it and look at eBay and everything, yeah. It, the back market is worth over a hundred million dollars a year. That's oh, yeah. that's it, it's it's well over that at this point. Yeah, that's uh, money. Gross that's, multiples of that at this point. The, the, <laughs> the, and, that, and that's money that's going into the comic shops that that you don't see. Comic Ron, uh, we we do a sales number every month where we'll where we'll say what the what what the dollar value was of all the comics and graphic novels that went through comic shops through Diamond. And it'll be like, you know, 35, 40, 50 million dollars. Well, there, you know, that number is high because if retailers discounted something, well, or if something didn't sell, well, yes. But on the other hand, those copies that uh, the retailers sold for a hundred hours, for fifty dollars, for whatever, we don't yeah. see that. We can't track that. Nobody can track that. And nobody else has that. Nobody, you know, it's, it's, I, again, I, I'm, I'm still very optimistic about this business, even through the pandemic. Um, you know, it, it was, it was, I, I wrote a, I wrote a column that was on, uh, 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 you know, is I wrote it at 2 a.m. And I think I said it was, it was Hope and Comics at 2 a.m. And this was like March. 
This was when Diamond was seizing up. And one of the things that I said in that column is one of the things that's going to help get us out is the collectors. It's the fact that, you know, Steve Jeppy got roasted for saying this in a, in a, in a video. He said, he said, there are going to be pandemic collectibles. There are going to be things that are going to be rarer in this era than, than not. Um, it's true. It's true. And, and you know, the, uh, the PlayStation the, five. Yeah. There you go. And, and, <laughs> <laughs> and you've got in comics, uh, 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 the comic book is something you can actually still buy because the show is going. Uh, when, when nothing was coming out, that was bad. But once the show started again, well, what are we benefiting from? We're benefiting from the fact that there are no conventions currently. Mm. We that's uh, That's a negative at the same time. I, I, it's driving me crazy, <laughs> but it's, I, I had a, I had a book that came out. Please go buy Star Trek Discovery Die Standing because it came out, you know, and I, I, I haven't gotten to sign a copy in person yet. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but the, 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 so that's, a, that's a negative, but a positive is that that money has been there with nowhere to go. And a lot of what we're seeing it, with, sites like yours or with the apps and that everything else, people have more time than they had before to spend chasing some of these things, to spend doing things that were, uh, you know, if I ever get around to it projects uh, and it, you know, I'm finally going to fill that run. You know, it, it, the, the, the one run that I actually filled out was Iron Man. Which, and that's, that's really why, that's, that's why I actually went to uh, when, when Marvel came and said, what do you want to write? I said, I want to write Iron Man. It wasn't really that I loved the character that much. It was that I had every issue. <laughs> and it had taken me 20 years to do it because I didn't have eBay. I didn't have any, everything else. And so, so yeah, I, I will say I've been, do, I, I've, I've, I've used this time myself to try to finish my own collecting project. Uh, I just this week am getting in the mail my 4,000th statement of ownership from the backs of the comics that say the sales figures in the back. And there are only about four thousand and thirty. So I'm really down to the you know. There's there's only six comic books left I need. They're god awful. You don't have them. I know you don't have them. Nobody <laughs> should have them. They're they're not anything anybody should want. Uh, but it's it's uh, it's and and then issues of you know issues of magazine like magazines like Sick, uh, which was a which was one of the cracked Mad Magazine comparators. Uh, these are not things that you're going to find sitting around anywhere. So, but I, but yeah, I finally this year I said yeah, I'm just going to go ahead and get the rest of them because I, I cannot count on going to conventions and having fun looking for things. Awesome, uh, John. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we've gotten, we've we've covered. I've learned a lot about comic art. It's, it's more like my head is still going. Okay, I, I feel like I just got I a master's understood. degree in comics. <laughs> uh, like I'm gonna go now. Shit that I thought I knew. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know anything. I, qu I quit. Bye. <laughs> uh, but yeah, well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Let me uh, if I can plug a few things here. Yeah, absolutely, okay. please. please. All right. Uh, uh, well, obviously, Comicron is uh, is still ongoing. Uh, the uh, uh, yeah, we will be doing sales charts for October as soon as Diamond gets them out. And then it'll take me a while to do the math because it's just harder right now uh, because of the things I've mentioned. Uh, but and then DC, I've been I figured out a way to do those too. But again, this has got to be one of those eras where we're going to be backfilling it. Um, uh, Comicron, I've got uh, Comicron has a, a a Twitter page, just Comicron. Uh, Facebook as well, Comicron. Uh, Comicron also has a Patreon, uh, which is Patreon.com/Comicron. Uh, basically, everything there goes to helping me buy these, you know, I really don't want to actually have to pay $100 to get an issue of Dagwood, uh, but I'm going to have to. <laughs> because when the comics are so, so bad that nobody, necessarily, but when nobody, nobody saved them. So that's the other reason things are rare is nobody saved them. <laughs> They were that bad. <laughs> usually, a, usually a reason, um, but yeah, I, I prefer not to actually have to spend food money on those. Uh, but uh, but then again, and and then on uh, on my 
on my uh, creative side, uh, farawaypress.com. Uh, there's a relaunch coming on that. But even right now, there's behind the scenes pages on all the comics I've done. Yeah, that's uh, I read, read a few of those. It was, it was fascinating. Um, uh, uh, JJM Faraway is the uh, is the Twitter. Uh, John Jackson Miller on Facebook. Uh, and, uh, and we'll the, have all this info, not to interrupt you, all good. this info will be on the site for those people going, pause, slow oh, down. Yeah, there, yeah, it will all be on the site. It'll all be in here. Keep going, John. Sorry. Uh, no, so that's all cool. Uh, the new books that I've got out and some of them are technically old books, but, uh, uh, the, 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 the aforementioned novel, Star Trek, Star Trek Discovery, Die Standing, uh, that's in trade paperback, uh, and also a awesome audio book, just a wonderful audio book. Uh, it's uh, it's about the the evil uh, Emperor Georgiou from the uh, uh, from the uh, from the mirror universe. Her first mission for Section Thirty One. Uh, that that is that is out and available now. Uh, just out this last month, uh, we have a book called uh, uh, Star Wars: The Empire Strikes Back from a Certain Point of View, and that uh, tells people. Uh, that that's they, these are all stories that tie in with the Empire Strikes Back. Uh, my story is the fourth one I've told with a character called Ray Sloan, who appears uh, in the first novel in the new continuity of uh, of, of the novels. Uh, it was a book called Star Wars: A New Dawn. And if you're looking for another comic book collectible, uh, go get Star Wars: Kanan, The Last Padawan, uh, issue twelve. She appears in comics for the first time there. Uh, that came out about uh, that came out about a, 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 a about five years ago, I think. Um, I got one. There you go. There you go. So 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 that is out. She also just appeared in the new video game Star Wars Squadrons. So so who knows where else she may appear? Who knows? Um, and uh, and you know I, I've got stuff coming out that I don't even know I've got coming out. I I, <laughs> I, I discovered it's it's behind me. You can't see it, but it's uh, it's a uh, it, the uh, they've collected all my Mass Effect comics from Dark Horse. In a massive compendium for Christmas, uh, so it's it's not just mine; it's all the comics. It's uh, it's Mass Effect: The Complete <coughs> Comics Omnibus. It's like 400 pages. Uh, it's another big doorstop of a book. Mm. Uh, <laughs> and finally, I, I had no idea I, I was in this, but uh, apparently uh, I'm in the uh, the the Many Lives of Captain Marvel, which uh, just came out. Uh, another trade paperback collection, uh, and uh, that actually grabs. Uh, the one Captain Marvel appearance I ever wrote from uh, Iron Man. So <laughs> I was right. like, I'm glad to see it. I'll, I'll, I'll be looking forward to get a copy. <laughs> it was important. But that's that's all stuff that's out here in this stretch. Okay. That's cool. cool. That's, that's awesome. awesome. As always, head to comicbookinvest.com to check out the latest article in the Three Comic Money and uh, catch our, our videos every uh, Saturday.